Hello, hello. I'm Savannah. And I'm Alicia. And this is Burden of Proof. This feels weird. We haven't recorded in weeks. I know. Our apologies to everyone. Yeah, we're so sorry. I'm sure you noticed. Yes. Jody Arias part one came out. Two weeks and ago. Then three weeks ago. Part two got delayed. Technical difficulties. So what had happened was we recorded. It was a fantastic episode. And Alicia was editing it. And then she realized that only my microphone recorded. Yeah. So you would have just had an hour of me and Alicia talking. You could hear me faintly. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Unfortunately, our settings got messed up when we recorded and I did not catch it. No, that's okay. My bad. And I'm sorry. But here we are. We're back. We're better than ever. And we're uh, we're ready to get into Jodi Arias part two, take two. Take two. Um, So if you just finished listening to part one, Good job. If you listened to it a couple weeks ago and you're like, I don't really remember where we left off, maybe go back. You know, maybe go listen to it again. That would be great. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but we left off with wait, wait. wait. Oh yes, wait. We have we have have business. Patreon shout outs first. We do have to give our Patreon shout outs. So shout out to Megan and shout out to Sarah for joining our Patreon page. Thank you so much. And then if you participated on our um, social media stuff this week, or I think it was actually the week of the 14th or something like that. Like I said, it's been a couple weeks since we recorded. Stay tuned to the end and you'll have a shout out then too. Yes. I'm out of it. I'm just back from vacation. So yeah, (laughs) it's okay. I um, visited the lovely city of Portland. Portlandia. Portlandia. I love you. It was wonderful. I did not want to come back. Yeah. Well, you're here. So let's talk about (laughs) murder. Yes. We left off at the end of part two. Travis Alexander's friends had not heard from him for five days. And eventually they show up at his house and find him um, slaughtered in his bathroom. So if you want all the juicy interpersonal drama details about Travis and Jody, that's all in part one. Yes. Part two, I'm going to start off with two minor corrections from part one that are hilariously funny. Um, Number one, first of all, I don't even remember if I said the name of this place in part one, but I did learn um, in between recording that I was pronouncing Eureka, California incorrectly. Yes, I think you did. I called it it Rekka. Yeah, I think so. (laughs) And it's Eureka. (laughs) It's spelled ridiculously. So ignore me. It's Eureka. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, (laughs) The second correction is that I said at the end of part two that after Travis was killed at the time, I said that he did not have roommates living in his home. Shockingly, that's not true. He had two grown adult roommates renting rooms in his house. He was dead in the home for five days and still friends who did not live there had to come and find him. How do you how bleh. there were signs too. His car was in the garage. His purity ring was on the kitchen counter, the one that he never took off unless he was about to have sex with Jody. Like that's on the kitchen counter. And they hadn't heard from him for days. Yeah. I how I think that's the difference between girl roommates and boy roommates. Yeah. I can't imagine living with someone and not and being like I'm These too, things are out of place for I'm that too nosy. many days. Yeah, I'm too nosy. Like I'm, a day, maybe two days, but... And the other thing is it's Travis's house. They rented there. I mean, they, it, obviously it's their home. They rented there, but Travis owned this house. Yeah. It's weird for homeowners to not, like, check. Be, be around. Or, like, text them and say, like, is everything good? I don't know. It's not their fault. No. That he died. No. But it's definitely their fault that he didn't get found earlier. <laughs> it's it's weird. It's, it's certainly strange. 
I, uh, I mean, when your roommates, like, to a certain extent, yeah, mind your business, but... Right, and... If you notice weird things happening, mm-hmm. like, maybe just check in. You good, fam? See how it is. Yeah. See how... What's good, is my kids like to say. What's good? What's good? So, um, again, we're in Mesa, Arizona. Travis's friends find his body, and by the time the medical examiner and the police get there... Um, they were in for a really gruesome crime scene. Travis had basically been sitting in a pool of water and blood for five days, and the decomposition process had started. It's also June in Arizona. Yeah, how did they not smell something? There were two sets of doors in between them and Travis. Okay. So on one hand, I kind of get that because yeah. he there was a bathroom door, and then he had like French doors into the owner's yeah. bedroom. So fair on the smell thing also they're like men who i think they were like big gamers or something like that maybe i don't know maybe they just go straight to their gaming chair i don't know what you were doing okay but i'm trying to like not be like judgmental i i just i i think that's a legitimate question i don't know initially i thought same thing like if doors are closed but to hear that he was actually already decomposing. Well, I don't know how far decomposed he was. I just mean yeah. like five days is a long time for a body, even in air conditioning. Yeah. It's a long time. It made it difficult for them to figure out time of death, obviously. Yes. Because a lot of times on scenes and stuff, they can kind of guesstimate. They didn't really know what they were looking at here. They could tell that he had been shot, stabbed 27 times, and his throat had been slit. That seems excessive. Uh, right. Mm-hmm. And personal. Mm-hmm. I am going to now tell you what we think happened. Because, spoiler alert, she doesn't tell us. But the story goes that Jody was gearing up for a prepaid legal conference in Salt Lake City, Utah. She got gas cans from her friend that we talked about last episode. And she had previously staged the robbery of her grandparents' home, which included taking a twenty-five caliber pistol. Right. She told her new boyfriend, Ryan, that she would be coming to visit him in Salt Lake before or for the prepaid legal conference, like while she was there, which was supposed to be on June 4th. She was supposed to arrive in Salt Lake. Okay. Instead, she drove to Mesa, which she arrived at Travis's house, and they started taking pictures of each other with Travis's camera. Now, he had spent a pretty penny on this camera. It was kind of a nice one. And they were not using it to take pictures of the sunset. This is your warning. This episode is graphic and we will be discussing sex <laughs> in the courtroom <laughs> and on the podcast. So, yes, um, if you're listening with your child, maybe don't. <laughs> the, the two of them were taking nude photographs together before having sex. And um, when Travis went to take a shower... Jody began taking more photos of him before she brutally murdered him. Unfortunately, that is the clearest answer and story we have of the last moments of Travis Alexander's death. However, we do have photos of him moments before he died, including pictures wow. of when we think Jody dropped the camera in order to begin killing him. And it's really scary to see. After she killed Travis, she meticulously scrubbed any DNA from his body before getting in the car and going MIA. We know that she was likely driving around the desert looking for a good place to hide the murder weapons because they have still never been found. But she turned her phone off, so we truly don't know where she was. We have no track, no cell phone pings, nothing. Right. What we do know is that around seven hours later, she turns her phone back on and leaves Travis this message. I know Leslie called you, so I already talked to her, so uh, you can call her back if you want, but it's not necessary. Um, my phone died, so I wasn't getting back to anybody. Um, and what else? Oh, and I drove 100 miles in the wrong direction. Over 100 miles, thank you very much. So, yeah, remember New Mexico? <clears throat> it was a lot like that, only you weren't here to prevent me from going into the three digits, so fun, fun. Tell you all about that later. Um, also, we were talking about, <clears throat> when we were talking about your upcoming travels my way, I was looking at the May calendar, duh. 
so I'm all confused. Um, but Heather and I are going to see Othello on July 1st, and we would love for you to co accompany us. Um, I don't know when Team Freedom's event is, though, but, you know, it's on the list, so we could do, um, we could do Shakespeare, Crater Lake, and the coast. So if you, make, if you can make it. If not, we'll just do the coast in uh, Crater Lake. But let me know, and I will talk to you soon. Bye. I'm not sure how to feel about that. Right. So we see her laying her alibis. Her phone died. She drove 100 miles in the wrong direction, which I suppose was her excuse to her 24-hour late arrival to Salt Lake City. But we will eventually see that these uh, these lies that she was weaving were not quite a tight enough knit. All right. There's still some holes. Yeah. I was just thinking, I'm not sure how to feel about that because I don't know how she normally talks. But in that message, she's like, talking very fast and she keeps clearing her throat and she keeps saying um over and over yeah that leans towards like somebody being nervous it's but a, i don't know how she normally it's a, talks. it's yeah i would say that that's accurate it's a little bit off from how she normally talks she yeah. um she's a bit of a chameleon she'll change her herself to what is needed in that situation mm -hmm. and so a lot of the footage i saw of her talking she was deliberately trying to be kind of meek and mild and we'll see that later but there are also points where you see she's got some fire in her. She's. It depends on yeah. how she talked to Travis normally. And I just don't know. Yeah. OK. So she arrives to Ryan's in Salt Lake City. They have sex less than 24 hours after she murdered Travis. Ryan noted that she had recently dyed her hair back from blonde to being a brunette. So her hair is dark yeah. again. And for a while it had been blonde. She told him that she had driven in the wrong direction, that she had been pulled over for her license plate being upside down on her way to Salt Lake City, to which she attributed that to, like, uh, just teenagers playing pranks, which was weird. And he also noted that her hands were covered in little nicks and cuts, and she said that those came from the restaurant that she worked in. Forensically, we know that these are the types of wounds that attackers get when they are stabbing people who are fighting back so right. we do know that scientifically was not the case from the restaurant yeah i've worked in restaurants right you don't <laughs> no. like maybe if you're a really bad prep cook maybe might have little <laughs> nicks and cuts yeah um i have never worked in a restaurant that's not true actually my very first job i was a host and i got fired um but <laughs> I have watched the bear. So I think that qualifies me to be able to say that's not where those are from. Anyway, Jody arrives to the prepaid legal conference and expects for Travis to be found right away. I was listening to the last podcast on the left cover this case, and they had a good theory that I am going to repeat because I thought it was good. They basically were saying that Jody probably plans to use the prepaid legal conference to further her narrative of her and Travis being closer emotionally than they were. They would be at this prepaid legal conference when they found out Travis had been killed, and it would solidify her grief in front of witnesses. And not only that, it would establish that she wasn't in Arizona at the time of the murders. Which, gotcha. yeah, I understand her theory, but it actually does not because she was late. <laughs> so. Yes. It doesn't really keep her away alibi wise, but I understand the social aspect of Travis was a really big name in prepaid legal. And so if she was able to show everyone around her how destroyed she was, people would be like, oh, my gosh, she never could have. Did you see how upset she was? Yeah. But that didn't happen because Travis wasn't found right away. <laughs> she spent the entire conference acting as if Travis was still alive People asked about him and Jody made sure that everyone knew that they were friends and that they were talking and he was great and et cetera. In actuality, it was actually a point of contention between Travis and Jody that Travis wouldn't acknowledge that she was even his friend in public or around people at prepaid legal. So interesting. Yeah. We talked about that in the first part. We did. Yeah. Their relationship was... Britney Spears level of toxic. Not that Britney Spears is toxic. I'm just like making a joke about the song title. Free <laughs> yeah. Britney. Free Britney. Free Britney. 
after the conference, she goes back to Eureka, Eureka, California, <laughs> to see her parents, where she told them that she was going to be out of town for a while. And when they were like, why? Where are you going? She was like, I just have to get out of here. I might be blamed for something. And they're like, I can't. They were like, what are you talking about? And she didn't elaborate. She was like, I just have to go. <laughs> why even try to cover it up? So because it's almost like she wants to get caught. Well, and uh, yeah, we'll see more about that too. It's just really bizarre. She and her parents um didn't really talk very much, so I think when she was talking with her parents, she didn't really have to keep up the facade anymore and she was able to be like it's just whatever. Like I'm fine. I'm just going to be blamed for something. I have to get out of town. Whereas like when she's calling Travis's friends and family being like oh my gosh, have you heard from Travis? Like, I haven't heard from him. This is so weird. And he, she's still playing up the part. Yeah. Or the ideal version of her in her head where her and Travis are together, whatever the case is. She doesn't have to do that with her parents because they don't talk and she doesn't care of their opinion of her. She cares what other people think, but not her parents. Gotcha. But also the camera. Mm-hmm. She left behind the camera. Oh, we'll talk right. about the camera. Okay. She took care of the camera. Or so she thought. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> okay. She had rented a car to go to Mesa, and she returns that rental car about 36 hours after the crime. I know we're jumping around a little bit timeline-wise, but it all happened so fast. So Right. after Because the, the conference was only like a couple days. It wasn't like a week-long conference. She... Kills Travis, goes to the conference for like a day and a half, and then she takes the car back and returns it. And the technician was like, uh, yeah, there were a lot of really big red juice stains in the back, and the floor mats were gone. Ew. I, I, yeah, I don't know why he didn't say anything to anybody, because that's like you don't sign, and it's not like you have a confidentiality agreement between rentee and rent <laughs> and technician. I can't. <sighs> yep. I just, oh, okay. The consistency is what's getting me. I don't, I'm oh. trying to think of how to say this without being too graphic or gross. Did you think it was juice stains because she cleaned it up first? So it was just a stain, but the consistency was like okay. uh, just a liquid. Okay. I can explain this, um, but I think it would be better to explain it later. So okay, we'll come back Fair. to it, but we'll we'll explain why he thought they were juice stains. But I feel like they should have like a like a like a note section in the where they can say looks like juice, comma could be blood. So yeah. they have it on record. <laughs> I don't I don't know how it works, but maybe you should yeah. write could be blood, or maybe they should make it like an easy test, like a like a pregnancy test that you just put it on there. If it's blood, it comes back positive. That would yeah. be cool. We should invent that anyway. And if it's too much, you. Yeah. Stop what you're doing and notify police. Yes. Anyway, the entire time she's still texting and emailing Travis, um, basically being like, uh -huh, I'm going to stay in your house and in your bed while you're in Mexico and like flirting and continuing on their relationship as if he was responding to her. After his body is found, um, investigators start talking to friends and family and right away they get the immediate consensus that Jody is the person that they need to talk to. In addition to that, they found lots of evidence at the scene, including uh, basically a full handprint with fingerprint in the hallway in blood. In the hallway? Like, there was, like, a hallway between the bathroom and the room. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't, like, outside. Like, just one more thing the roommates missed. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, I, I'm pretty sure it was, gotcha. like, in a hallway between there. And there okay. was, like, a full full handprint and, like, a fingerprint. Mm -hmm. So, Jody didn't know right away when the body had been found, because why would they have told her but somebody called her and told her i'm not sure who and when she found out she immediately inserted herself into the investigation of course but don't you worry she was their prime suspect like from day one they knew who this was they just had to figure out how to get her yeah so they figured out that june 4th was his date of death and they started to try and get an alibi for jody now, she was supposed to be in Salt Lake, but she didn't show up until the 5th. Between that, they're 
previous relationship and how they knew like what stories they had heard from their friends and I'm sure the robbery incident where they saw that there was a gun stolen. They pulled Jody in to talk to her. They were talking to Jody. They talked to her for the first time. You know, that first interrogation, just talk, really just casual, get to know you. While they were at the scene of the crime, while they had her in custody, the police found the most amazing piece of evidence. In the washing machine, along with all of the towels she had used to clean up the blood, they found the camera. Now, she had deleted the pictures from the camera, but the memory card was in a waterproof compartment. And so Mm. forensics were able to, over time, piece the photos back together based on the memory and the memory card. Yes. Going back to the car, she had cleaned up a lot of the blood in the crime scene, and she never moved his body. So it wasn't like she put a ton of blood in the car. I think it was literally just, like, spots from where the murder weapons had been. Gotcha. She did transport those. Yeah. So it was probably just, like, several, like, palm-sized stains. That could be like juice spilling out of a cup kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And it it wasn't like the kind of blood that you get that's been like well, it may have been or transported. Watered down. Yeah, because she probably washed it off. Yes. So, so that, yeah, that's where. Yeah, not to be gross. The whole consistency thing. It was hard to think yeah. of a way to, without getting too gross of like. Blood is not the same consistency and because you have not just yeah. the red blood cells, but you have this, you know, uh, the, the word is escaping me at this moment, but the, the, the part the of the blood that causes it to clot. Yeah. That scat, you know, like if you get a cut or something, right. you scab it, over. It's all... So that's very thick. And once it dries, it's stiff. So that's why I was like, mm, what was it really the consistency of juice? Yeah. Right. But there was nothing um in the put in the car that could have given that consistency. From gotcha. what I gather, I didn't like ask them. <laughs> yeah. I didn't call up the tag, but that's like what I would assume. So, like I said, they talked with her, they let her go cuz that was really pretty early in the investigation. They they knew she was a suspect, but at the same time, you know, you got to you got to vet all your sources. Well, yes. They piece together those forensic photos, but that took some time. And in the meantime, Jody attends Travis's celebration of life and his memorial service. Awkward. Yeah. Later, <laughs> she was asked to come into the police department to provide fingerprints to, you know, clear her as a suspect. Of course. Which were easily matched to the ones found at the crime scene. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Now, her entire interrogation is on YouTube, and I watched a lot of it. She has quite a bit of strange behavior, including the following activities. She does a a headstand against the wall. She sings Silent Night. She plays with her hair. She takes a nap. And, like, she did all this while she was waiting. Like, you know, there's lots of downtime and interrogations. (laughs) But um, it's just weird. Just weird stuff. So... One thing you haven't talked about mm-hmm. is the pictures. Mm-hmm. I mean, you said they took, um, you talked about the pictures, obviously, but in detail, I'm just, they had the pictures at that point? Um, at this point, they they do. They do. Yeah. So, like I said, they it's this is all really fuzzy. Mm-hmm. Um. But from what I gather, they talked with her, they let her go, they arrest her, they extradite her from California back to Mesa. I should have been more clear. They extradite her from Mesa back to California. She is under arrest during this interrogation. Gotcha. And they have Um, the pictures. They have the pictures. She does not know that they have the pictures. So these pictures, are they, you know, is it obviously her? In the pictures? Yes. Um, yes. There are pictures of her face. There are pictures of her um, naked with her face. Mm. And there. this is also so weird that there is now a murderer where we can Google pictures of her butthole. <laughs> <laughs> 
So she couldn't very well, you know. Right. Right. Be like, <laughs> I'll prove me. it's not me because you don't have my face. No, yeah. We you have a picture of a butthole. Let me <laughs> let me present like a baboon. <laughs> I'll prove it to you. My butthole is different. <laughs> no. Um, it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> I know. This is so graphic. Uh, no, there was no denying. And they, they definitely were like, yeah. So, mm. but they, you know, they didn't tell her that right away. I wasn't sure because you were like, she did headstands and... No, no, and no. And all this stuff. I thought maybe she was like trying to be like, look, it wasn't me. Look, my butt is so look. much perkier. <laughs> <laughs> look at all the yoga I do to keep my body so perky. Yeah. No, that's not the case. She just thought she was going to get away with it. No. Yeah. So the investigator, again, kind of holds that in his back pocket. And Detective Flora starts asking for the timeline. And being like, where were you on June 4th? Okay. Yeah. She explains the same story that she had told Ryan, that she had driven in the wrong direction, that her phone had died. And by the time she finished the story, he pretty quickly pointed out, you're still missing 18 hours. Yeah. And she's, she's like, well, let's do it again. And she goes through the whole story again. And he's like, yeah, no, you're still missing 18 hours. And she's like, okay, well, let's go through it one more time. And finally, he's like, look, this, this math isn't mathing. You have almost 20 hours missing in your story, 18 full hours. Where were you? And she's like, well, did I tell you I got stranded? <laughs> By the way. And he was like, we know you were in Mesa in Travis's house on June 4th. And she's like, um, no, you don't because I wasn't. That's not a direct quote. It's just fun to pretend. We saw your baboon butt. <laughs> we saw your baboon butt. And then he pulls out yes, the pictures. You were. He pulls out the pictures, which are dated and time stamped as like, yeah. you were. This is you naked with pigtails. Oh. You were naked. This is you. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, she's you know, she's rested, obviously. <laughs> she's charged. And this is where officials really start to see her personality kind of coming through she's no longer this like innocent little creature she's like can i freshen up before you book me i just feel really like i want to can i go to the bathroom and they're like no <laughs> this is your freshen up before i go to jail this is your mug shot no Again, she doesn't immediately ask for an attorney, and when she gets her first phone call, she calls her parents and asks them to Google her name. See? It's like she wants to get caught. Ugh. I genuinely don't know if she wanted to get caught or if she thought she was going to get away with it until she realized that she wasn't, and then she was like, well, I may as well make the most of it. I don't know. Gross. It's hard to tell. Gross. So let's kind of jump forward to the trial, because I just feel like... We can. I just feel like there's nothing that happens in between here. She does some interviews. We're going to talk about those. But let's get into the meat and potatoes because. Okay. Boy, is it an interesting one. I, I titled this little two-part episode, The Courtroom None of Us Wanted to Be In because, mm -hmm. God, I don't want to be there. Like, I kind of do because what a story. But at the same time, oh, how horrific this was. So she's given a public defender um, and he was upset because he had actually just decided to stop being a public defender and that he was going to go be a solo practitioner. But he was ordered by the court, no, you have to come back and you have to represent Jody Arias. Why? I don't know. I didn't. I don't know. That's. I'm not sure. Okay. Fun fact. Kirk Nurmi. Which, Kirk Nurmi. Which is his name. Um, wrote three. 300 page books about representing Jody. They aren't good. <laughs> <laughs> they're very talkative. Uh they're they don't get to the point very quickly. <laughs> they're not they're not good. But you know, he did write them. Interesting. And there are a couple of reasons why he didn't want to represent Jody Arias. I mean, A. It's just really gonna hurt his business because he's not gonna win. <laughs> yeah. B, he knew she was guilty. 
and C, it became national news and uh, because she'd been doing all these interviews and he didn't want to represent the publicity of like representing somebody so guilty. Yeah. And D, Jody's story made it incredibly difficult to defend. Pretty soon after she was arrested and charged, this is the story that Jody told the media. She, and I'm, this is not a direct quote, but like, it just imagine it, yeah. okay? I'm just, pretend I'm Jody Arias. Well, yes, I was with Travis, you see, and we were together, but I didn't want anyone to know. And when I turned around, like, bam, there was a man and a woman, both in black clothes and ski masks. And they said, you're that bitch from California. And they <laughs> shot and killed Travis. And they said, if I ever told anyone, they would kill my family, too. And that's why I lied and didn't tell anyone what happened. End scene. Wow. <laughs> and she... <laughs> That's her story. Is she sticks to it. She sticks to that story for um, basically two years. In an interview with Inside Edition at the jail, Arias says, no jury is going to convict me. I am innocent. And you can mark my words on that. Mark my words. I hate when people say mark my words. I don't like it either. It's so ick. Do you know how um, confident you have to be to pull that off? I don't know, because the only people I can think of that say it... Well, first of all, I've never met anybody in real life that says it. But the only characters that I can think of that say that, they have confidence that they shouldn't have. Fair. And every time they say, mark my words, guess what? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Just know that if you say it, you're setting yourself up for failure. It's just... So the prosecution files a motion that they intend to seek the death penalty, saying that the crime was heavily premeditated. And the defense is already faced with a daunting task, so their mission completely turns around. They are not trying to prove that Jody is innocent. They are trying to save her life. Yes. Two years before the trial, but two years after the, the intruder story comes out. Okay. okay. Smushed right there in the middle. Kirk Nurmi receives an anonymous letter. This letter was allegedly and written by Travis Alexander, and they are allegedly admitting to drumroll, please. Because Alicia can't do a drum roll to save her life. I'm terrible. She's horrible at it. Allegedly, he admits to physical abuse, sexual abuse, and pedophilia. He admits in this alleged letter that he asked Jody to wear children's underwear and that he, quote, had the capability to molest one of his friend's children. Hmm. When I say, quote, it was the, the word capability was like the... That was his word. Hmm. Okay. So here's the rundown, okay? Basically, when discussing strategy, Kirk Nurmi, and yeah, I'm going to say his full name every time. <laughs> Kirk Nurmi brought up some things basically saying like, hey... You have a lot of the traits of somebody who was sexually abused. Was it your parents? Which is very similar to the Casey Anthony method. And rather than go for her parents, Jody swung for Travis. She put together these letters and she sent them. Whether or not we have proof that she sent them is up for debate. But we, we experts have looked at these letters and determined that they were piecemealed together from other things Travis had written. So... Gotcha. Nobody in their right mind believes that Travis actually wrote these letters. Either way, it helped the defense finally figure out what their angle was going to be in trial. Her story changes again, and this time she goes from saying that they were committed by two intruders to saying that, yes, she had killed Travis, but only in self-defense. Because, of course, she's a poor, battered woman. Jury selection begins December 10th, 2012. They chose 18 jurors and 18 alternates, all of which would be used during this very long and taxing trial. Prior to the trial, Jody's appearance appearance. Jody's, <laughs> Jody's appearance changes drastically from what we've seen before. She goes from this vibrant woman to almost a very matronly looking grandmother. <laughs> of course, this is very intentional. She gets bangs and, like, wears more more full-coverage clothing to, like, kind of make herself look more innocent. And, I mean, this is obviously a courtroom. We weren't expecting her to be, like, tits out. But, like, (laughs) we we were, you know, we didn't expect her to completely change. Yeah, no, she looks a lot older Mm -hmm. in the trial 
photos than she does in the photos right she wears taken with travis and stuff yeah and i mean yes there was time that passed and you're in jail so that's stressful that'll age you but it's a drastic it's pretty drastic right and she was wearing glasses and she wasn't wearing a full face of makeup and yes um she's very clearly trying to play the part of like a pure woman like a good mormon good mormon woman Mm mm-hmm that oh. does butt stuff. That does butt stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get canceled by the Mormons, so I'm not going to make any more Mormon butt stuff jokes, but just know that they're there. They're in my head. And they're here. Opening statements start on January 2nd, and it's shocking for everyone. The prosecution correctly claims that Jody premeditatively murdered Travis and tried to hide it, all in a jealous fit of rage. The defense claims that Travis was horribly abusive to Jody and that she was, like I said, a battered woman. They claim that Travis beat her, emotionally abused her, that he was a sexual deviant whose preferences in the bedroom showed his true nature and signs of pedophilia to further tarnish his reputation even further as he's already dead. It's a lot to process and I can't imagine that it would be really easy for the first day of a jury to like hear those accusations. And I also (laughs) kind of feel like Oh, so we're just we're jumping right we're jumping in there. Right in there. <laughs> um, I think eventually I'm going to do a little mini sode to talk about my experience at jury duty because oh yeah, you it, never told me. Oh my gosh, it was, it was crazy. I can tell you now if you want to cut it apart. It doesn't matter. Not if you want to do a mini. A, a yeah, I, I think I'm going to do a little mini sode on it because I want to follow up and see how it ended. But okay, yeah, wowza, we'll wait. We'll wait. Wowza. And this was kind of like that. Just even in jury selection, like we jumped in. Yeah. And we weren't supposed to because it's just void air. But Mm, the one time that I made it that far, they kind of had to. Because they have to make sure they rule out the right people. So they had to like really tell us. Right. They they he they weren't checking for bias here. They were trying to try the case in jury selection. It was very interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Anyway, a few weeks later, after spending days on end seeing bloody crime scene images, they would listen to Jody Arias testify for two weeks on the stand. Two weeks. Two weeks. What in the world do you have two weeks to talk about? Butt stuff. <laughs> Butt stuff. <laughs> I mean, uh basically just listening to the prosecution argue with her and um yeah so basically throughout the trial they heard story after story of travis and jody's sexual escapades and they were all told to express one aspect or another another of their relationship the most uncomfortable thing i can possibly imagine happening in a courtroom happened they played a full session for lack of a better word of phone sex between travis and jody if you remember me saying that Jody recorded Travis without his consent. Yeah. And they played it in the courtroom in front of his friends and family. Ugh. This was played with the intention of proving that some of the things he said were indicative of him having pedophilic ide- idealizations. But as somebody who listened to him, it doesn't really do that. It just doesn't. It's gross because it's personal. Deeply intimate between two people. But I don't think that he was a pedophile (laughs) because of what he said during phone sex. Yeah. Cool. They got super graphic. Just, I just can't imagine this happening in a professional environment. I just really struggle with it. I, and they talked in depth with Jody about things that her and Travis had talked about doing sexually, but never did. Like, there's only so much butt stuff you can do, right? <laughs> I don't think you want the answer to that question. I'm not. I, I don't think I'm I a simple know. woman, but like, I don't know. Okay. Well, Sorry. this is what we're Sorry about to get so hung up on the butt stuff. <laughs> this is what we're about to talk about is like, they were not, A, they were having premarital sex, which in the Mormon community is obviously right. not okay. But not only that, they were having like freaky sex. Like, and yeah. for Mormons, this is just insane. And like, of course, everybody's, you know, scale of what is freaky sex is different. But like, come on now, we can admit these are Mormons. 
and this is an intent this is yep so i'm not mormon and this is uh i'm a simple woman <laughs> um <laughs> i've never taken a picture of my butthole <laughs> firmly say i've never you taken a picture s- of my butthole i can say with confidence yeah. that nobody has ever taken a picture of my butthole okay moving on from the butthole <laughs> pics february tw- they didn't show the butthole pictures in court by the way I, they showed all well, the, that's good they showed photos of her i think they showed the pictures of the like from the camera obviously like the naked pictures but i'm pretty sure that they didn't show the actual butthole picture Oh well, yeah, they'd have Maybe to, they did. Like, I don't remember. I mean, did they like blur out parts of the pictures? I would, if ass- so, I would assume that they did. If I, so, then why would they show the butthole picture? Because you'd basically just have to blur the whole thing out. <laughs> just like <laughs> Just trust me, this censored block is a butthole. <laughs> just trust me on this. And it's her butthole. Cute. And she's like <laughs> do you want to see it? Do you want to see it? No. She was pretty adamant she didn't want those photos shown. I, I moving on. February 20th. I, yeah. <laughs> February 20th in the courtroom she described the afternoon of June 4th, 2008 when she claims she accidentally dropped Alexander's new camera while taking nude photos of him in the bathroom, which caused him to lose his temper. She says, in a rage, he picked her up and body slammed her into the tile floor and screamed at her. She said she ran into his closet to get away from him, but could hear his footsteps coming after her. She says she grabbed a gun from the shelf in his closet and tried to keep running, but eventually he came after her. She said, quote, I pointed it at him with both of my hands. I thought that would stop him, but he just kept running. He got like a linebacker. He got low and grabbed my waist. And as he was lunging at me, the gun went off. I didn't mean to shoot. I didn't even think I was holding the trigger. How can you use that as a defense when he's also stabbed and his throat is slit? I don't know. And also, I know they never found the actual murder weapons, but they could tell what kind of gun, what kind of ammunition hit him, correct? Mm Mm-hmm. And confirm that it's the same. Mm Mm-hmm. As the gun taken from her parents' or grandparents', grandparents house. house. So he conveniently had the same exact. Which she never produced. So if. Gun. She hid the murder weapons, never produced it, did never deny that it was a different gun. I, I'm. Yep. Okay. Cool. <laughs> cool. <laughs> cool. Cool beans. Um, another insane conversation that happened while she was on the stand. Jody said that some of her exploits with Alexander left her feeling like a prostitute, including a time where she played out a fantasy for him that involved performing oral sex for him on her front porch without speaking. She testified that he drove up to her house, got out of his car, walked up to the front porch for oral sex, and then left a few pieces of candy behind and walked away without a word, and it was over. Prosecutor Juan Martinez argued with her about how she was responsible for the couple's sex life. Quote, You introduced KY Jelly into the relationship to make it more sexually enjoyable, right? When we're talking about the level of experimentation, it looks like both of you were experimenting together sexually. So when we hear things like, I felt like a prostitute, that's not exactly true, is it? She responded with, it was often mutual. I didn't feel like a prostitute during, just after. I mean, I can understand that. But then stop. Like, I can totally understand... What she's saying as far as feeling like that because of the way he kept her at bay and, like, didn't want to acknowledge that he knew her, was friends with her, had any kind of relationship with her. I mean, I don't know. Maybe he just just... dropped a mint because (laughs) he's like, here, you're going to need that. Um, Oh, my gosh. But. (laughs) Alicia. (laughs) Um, Like you. (laughs) That's not that risque. Of I a just thing said to say. the words KY jelly on our podcast. I, I, yeah. So it's fine. Um, We've talked about butt stuff and baboon yeah, butt pics. This so is a- I, I just don't. But then stop. Which I said in the first part about their relationship is like both of them 
have their oh, parts yeah. and and did anything he did make him deserve this absolutely not i just yep that's where she's accountable is oh right or need needed to be is okay if somebody makes if if you feel like somebody makes you feel like a prostitute then maybe you should stop seeing that person right especially when they were just mutually toxic for each other it's just such a messy relationship that it's like you can't yeah part one is very telling i didn't know how messy their relationship was until i got into this research and it's insane she said several times on the stand that she was either planning on killing herself or had attempted to or talking about the times that she had thought or planned to kill herself um, throughout their relationship and throughout her alleged abuse again i don't even think this is false there were lots of times where her friends tried to tell her she wasn't doing well trying to try get her to commit to an institution or get you know some longer term inpatient treatment they tried really hard several different times this is a known thing yeah so not saying that that's incorrect i just don't think that she was being like abused to the extent that she says she was i don't think it was abuse at all because it was mutual but well i wanted to clarify what i said when i'm like stop and people who have suffered abuse or like i can't you know like i know i understand but to me this seems it seems based on the information we have as though she could have actually cut contact with him and he wouldn't necessarily have chased her down he would yeah and and he may have tried a couple times to contact her but like if she really said no he would have let it be Right. And it, found moved on and found somebody else, probably. Right. It was it was toxic and I he treated her shitty. She treated him crappy sometimes. Yeah. They both it was so messy. They were lending each other money. Remember that? Like yeah. the whole thing is so messy. But they are both at fault for the toxicity in their relationship. They just freaking brought out the worst in each other. Yes. They were just not good together. And yeah, he was kind of acting shitty to her. Yeah. But she also was acting but crazy. She needed help. She yeah. was breaking in her his freaking doggy door, dude. Yeah. I, I can't stress that enough. Yeah. If you find yourself. If somebody gets in your house through your doggy door, please establish that they had a good reason to do so. Please. <laughs> were they running from a snake? <laughs> were they were they um did they need to use the bathroom were they number just two playing with the dog and, and got yeah and jokingly right. went in and got stuck like were they I doing don't know. it in front of their friends as a joke yeah was it a hold my beer kind of situation yeah, yeah. was it a hold my beer situation <laughs> if not if you were um just not home and she wanted to come in and bake you cookies and sleep in your bed, but you had changed the locks. Maybe reevaluate who you're sleeping with. I'm just saying. Yeah. It's so complicated. Anyway, I also want to clarify that watching this prosecutor cross interrogate, cross interrogate, you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> cross examine. Cross examine yeah. people on the stand was very difficult, not just Jody. Okay. Watching him do this with other witnesses was painful. This is what I mean when I say I don't want to be in the courtroom. I mean, obviously, yeah. it's very upsetting to see and listen to phone sex, but also the drama. Kind of live for that. This is the part I wouldn't want to be in. This courtroom had to have been so tense. I think he was very unprofessional, in my opinion. I've seen things in a courtroom before. I don't think that his level of of aggression was necessary sometimes. Um, And I think as a juror, it would have thrown me off. I think he was trying to come across as a hard ass, but it was not giving that. And I would have really struggled with his attitude, um, especially in a case that's already so difficult. When somebody is so clearly guilty. Yes. It's just unnecessary. Like, you don't have to be that guy. Right. You know, you don't have to be that person to, like, push so hard. And it makes you unlikable to the jury, which then gives mixed emotions in the jury of, like, 
Well, I clearly she's guilty, but like when the prosecutor is unlikable, that in a way, yeah. If she and- if it, if it wasn't such a cut and dry case as far as her guilt goes, like with the handprint and the blood and the, all of that stuff. You want to be likable to the jury. You right. don't have to be likable to anybody else, but you want to be likable to the jury because that right. can, yeah, they're not supposed to have, you know, be picking sides based on who they like, but. But it does all, affect it. We're all human. Right. And, and it's possible. It just would have been such an uncomfortable room to be in. And I'm not saying that it should be comfortable. I'm just saying there's there's no reason for this. Mm-hmm. Um, And. Like I said, if I felt like it had just happened when he was talking to Jody, that would be one thing. I feel like maybe you were just really angry. But I I mean, I watched quite a bit of this trial. He's like this with other people, too. Yeah. He would just yell when people didn't answer the specific question he was asking, which I understand. That's You want them to answer the question. You don't want all the other stuff, but there's just no reason. They answered the people question. You're nervous. just being a jerk. Yeah. They're nervous. Right. And so they don't know... And and for a lot of people, I'm one of these people, I don't mean this literally when I say I struggle with yes and no questions, but I'm a person that lives in the gray a yes. lot. Like, I don't see things black and white hardly ever. So I could answer yes, but I'm going to want to give you the but. <laughs> right. Yes, but. And this that's and this where and he this. would start yelling. Yeah. And there's like one particular instance where he's talking to Jody and he's asking her what time of day she went into a shift at a restaurant she was working in. Mm-hmm. And she's like in the morning and he's like, what time? And she says in the morning, like clearly she's trying to be like, I don't remember. But if I say that, you're going to yell at me. And yeah. he's like, so you can remember what drink you got at Starbucks, but you can't remember what time you worked that day. And she says, I always get the same drink at Starbucks. And he starts yelling that she's explaining herself. <laughs> When you asked a question. So it's just, it would have been a really exhausting courtroom to be in. Yeah. An interesting thing about Arizona capital cases is that the jury, and I don't know if it's just capital, but in Arizona cases, the jury was allowed to ask the defendant questions. So they asked over 150 questions. Some questions focused on things that just didn't add up. Again, they asked how she could remember such specific details of raunchy sexual encounters with Travis, but... Other times she said her memory was scrambled and that she couldn't remember specific dates or times or other things. Um, And they also asked her like other, you know, smaller questions. You know, they asked her a lot of questions. 150 questions is a lot of questions. That's a lot. Yeah. In the capital murder case, death penalty against Jody Arias, the jury was hung. I know that this seems like an open and shut case, but please remember that they weren't just deciding whether or not she did it. They were deciding all of the mitigating factors and whether or not the death penalty should be at play. Yeah. The judge declared this a mistrial, and in 2015, after a retrial, the jury was once again undeclared. Wow. Interestingly, though, in the retrial, there were no cameras allowed, and Jody did not take the stand, but we had the same outcome. Wow. Interesting. Very. In the state of Arizona, two hung juries in a capital case means that the death penalty is no longer on the table. Yeah. That being said, the judge sentenced Jody Arias to life without parole for the death of Travis Travis Alexander. I think that's fair. I mean, I know. Yeah. We've talked about death penalty before, and I'm not totally against it, but I, I think sometimes it gets handed out a little too frequently or easily. It's just so fascinating to me that the that the jury was hung t- both times with different evidence, and I think yeah. that goes to show that sometimes capital cases are are uh, are a risk. Yes, on that front. So, but yeah, that is Jody Arias part two. You made it to the end of the story. You made it a whole month. Thank you. Thank you. Again, we're sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't even have any closing thoughts, honestly. <laughs> What's there to say? Yeah, I think we've said everything. Just be careful if you Google the butthole pictures. <laughs> Please don't Google that. <laughs> Please don't Google that. We won't be posting them. <laughs> I also probably won't be posting the pictures of Travis moments before his death. Those are all over the internet. Ew. I don't want to do that. No. That's so just not... it's the same. We had another case. Oh, oh, it was the Carl Tanzler case. 
that we talked about where there are pictures. I didn't feel comfortable posting them. Yeah. So same situation here. I ain't no, doing it. I I yeah. would not. Ick. But thank you for hanging in there. Yeah. You did a good job. Thank you. If you made it to the end of the episode. <laughs> There's no butthole <laughs> There's, emojis. There, <laughs> Uh, please don't leave us a butthole <laughs> emoji. Oh, gosh. Okay, so if you made it to this point in the episode, please leave us a uh, cactus emoji. Because desert. <laughs> because. Because there's no doggy door There's emoji. no doggy door emoji. And I wish there was a doggy door emoji so bad. But this case is so difficult. And I'm glad that you hung in there. Um. Uh, again, I just want to say, I know we talked about it a lot in ep- in part one. By no means in explaining their relationship are we trying to blame Travis for what happened. Oh, There's God, absolutely no, no excuse for no. the brutality in his murder. Um, And nobody, nobody deserves to die like that. No. Just because you choose questionable relationship doesn't, doesn't, mean, doesn't mean that you deserve what he went through right so so um you know yeah go wildcats <laughs> go wildcats we also wanted to do a quick shout out to those of you who participated on some of our amazing social media stuff a couple weeks ago this was part of your prize for communicating with us and letting us know i asked what was new in your life and the coolest answer would win a shout out and a mention on the podcast so here we are with the coolest answers. Drum roll, please. <laughs> you really do suck at that. <laughs> I do. Yeah, I think it's because of my neurological condition that gives me tremors. Oh, great. Make me yeah. the asshole. <laughs> Make fun of me. Oh, I'm just kidding. Um, do you want to do this first one? Okay. Uh, oh, Tolly had an offer accepted on a new house awesome congratulations congratulations i love that that's so good for you that's so exciting yeah amber's daughter was selected to be the starting catcher on the varsity softball team as a freshman nice so that is so exciting and finally, Amanda's dog learned that um, the new favorite toy is a squeaky ball inside of a sock. And I just, she sent a picture. So <laughs> dog picks always win. Yeah. So thank you guys so much for. We love the dogs. Sharing all of your highlights with us. And we appreciate it. We love talking with you. Um, and this episode comes out the day before our Patreon live stream for the month yep. of March. So if you're not a patron and you want to join us for our live stream, we spend about an hour with you guys chatting, answering questions, talking all the fun stuff. Join us on Patreon. Yep. What else can they get on Patreon? <laughs> she's <laughs> she's not answering. I've been on vacation. Uh you can also uh, get I, I still have vacation brain. Uh no. You can get uh outtakes yes. from our episodes. Uh when we have them. Yeah, sometimes we don't want to we don't want to cut too much out, so there's not yes. always outtakes. Um, but we try to get outtakes, and we do the live stream, and you can join our private Facebook group, mm-hmm. and you get to choose one case a month. Yes, I mean not you specifically, but the patrons, the yeah, group you get as to a vote. whole. You get to vote. Yes. Uh last month's what or March's was Lisa McVeigh. Mm-hmm. So if you liked that, there's more where that came from. You get to choose on Patreon. And I'm excited to announce that, oh my gosh, I'm really terrified I'm going to say her name wrong now. Aileen Wornos yeah. was the pick for April. So that'll be coming. Dun, dun, dun. Woohoo! I think that's all our business. I think so. Thanks for sticking around, you guys. We will talk to you next week. Till next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening, guys. Find us on Instagram and TikTok at Burden of Proof Pod and email us at burdenofproofpod at gmail.com.